Okay, let's begin. So I have a couple homework problems for you. Mostly the analytical problems, if you know what you're doing, it's like 30 or 40 minutes worth of work. So some of you will still need to practice writing down likelihoods properly, recognizing distributions, and that'll add a bunch of time. So spend time doing that. If it is really quick, make sure you remember what your forms of the distributions are. I'll ask you to extend all of these problems soon. So we're still in kind of the, the part where we're just getting acquainted again with what are these distributions, what does a Bayesian do? We're taking it fairly slow. Saying that, um, we're ahead of schedule as well. So um, I can appreciate that it might be fairly slow for me in a little quick. So we'll do a review session soon, tomorrow, 5.30. We'll do one again next week. And I'm inclined to give you guys a day off soonish, but not yet, not this week. So I go over a couple minutes, I do watch that. I feel a little bit bad about it, so I just try to give you something back in return. That's what an apology looks like to me. Um, okay, so homework, hopefully everybody's had a chance to kind of look at it. I ask you basically write down the likelihood function from mu. We've been doing that a lot. There's a lot of ways you can write that down. Um, I do tell you sigma squared is known in this problem. So this does have the sigma squared attached to it. And I'm just kind of doing my typical thing and slowly acquainting you to different notations. So which likelihood are you going to write down? The one with the sigma squared known. So I'm not asking you to integrate anything else yet. Um, so under this prior, and I call it a reference prior, you might want to look up that term. So I've italicized it. Um, I'll tell you what it means later, towards the end of class. It's also the Jeffries prior. It's also the hard prior, it's shift invariant. So there's a lot of good properties for this. And this prior also induces optimal frequentist coverage. So lots of cool things going on with that prior. Everybody agrees when it comes to mu and a normal distribution. So things start to change um, as we go into other distributions, though. Okay, so nothing too fancy right here. In another homework, I'm going to ask you to use this posterior distribution, and we're going to do something really similar to what we're going to do today. I'm going to do the steps in slightly different order, and it doesn't really matter. So at the end of problem one, you're going to come up with this posterior distribution. And I'll call it x bar because the data comes in the form of x bar. But you have to be careful. If you've just used x bar, you're about to mess things up if you try to infer the variance too. So given sigma squared, this is all pretty easy. But I'm just going to write down cap x, all my data. So you're going to have a vector of data and not just the one data point. We'll do something similar today with all the data. Um, you're going to write this down. This is problem one. But you're going to come up with your answer. Does anybody know what the answer is? I'm sure some of you do. What distribution do, do you think this follows? Normal. Good. What do you think the mean is? <laughs> X bar. And? Sigma squared over n. And if I wanted to write that differently, I could write it as 1 over phi n. So I don't flip the whole thing over. If I'm talking about the precision, I just flip over that sigma squared parameter. So you'll come up with that. And you can almost do it in one step if you knew something about minimal sufficient statistics. Cal, just write down the likelihood using x bar scale sigma squared by n's. Multiply by 1. That's the easiest multiplication. And recognize the posterior. Bada bing, bada boom, you're done. If you do everything by expanding the square and recognizing the terms, that might help you out um, for future problems. So in homework 2, I'm going to ask you this. I'm going to ask you to write down the marginal posterior distribution given all of my x's. And you're going to do it like this. You're going to take this distribution, mu, given phi and x. And then I'm going to multiply by this posterior distribution. So in the next homework, I ask you to do this. So that's the problem we're working on today, but I'm asking you to do it in slightly different steps where I first ask you to find this, right here. How do you find that distribution? You 
you've taken a probability class, you know there's really only one way to do it. If I gave you the joint, if I gave you the data in the model, you have the joint, what do you do to the joint? Marginalize over? So you would just do this. Write this thing down, mu and phi, given x. And you would integrate over mu. See if you can maybe get ahead and try that. You'll need to complete the square to recognize that. So um, we're going to do this same problem. I'll give you what that posterior is. But just keep in mind, we're going to extend some of these problems. So if you're making them too simple and moving on, um, you're going to have to backtrack eventually. Re check your steps. So you would do that if you wanted this margin. Why is this the correct thing to do and why not mu? Mu is what the distribution's on, so we can't condition on. Over here, this is conditioned on phi and x. They're clearly not independent of each other. They have something to do with each other. And so if you wrote down the prior right here, you'd be making a huge mistake because you've got a condition on your data. You've conditioned on your data here, so you've got a condition on your data everywhere. So that's one way to do the problem. I could have done the problem, and I'll do it like this on the board for you guys, or I just write down the likelihood and I just integrate out phi directly. So it's just maybe a faster way to do it. The advantage here is that if you knew what that distribution was off the top of your head, and you knew what that distribution was, you could use them. So different ways to write down the same thing. Um, what distribution do you think this follows? We've done it conditional on mu and we knew it was gamma. What distribution do you think it follows when we integrate out mu? Any guesses? No guesses? Just the family. Can you see it in your head? Little steps you're gonna do? I'll wait until somebody throws out an answer. Should have brought a pillow. Catch up real quick. What's distributional family do you think that lives in? Anna was probably racking her brain going, what other distribution lives between zero and infinity that's, maybe if it's chi-squared, it's gamma or something like that. It's another gamma, it's just a different gamma. So you'll work through the steps and you'll get whatever gamma that is, but conditioning on mu um, gives you a different gamma. So you're changing the parameters in that gamma. You do have to do a little bit of math to figure it out. So just another gamma. So just some hints for the future. Um, I ask you to repeat this exercise for the beta binomial, so you're basically just carrying out what we've done in class. You'll use that exercise in the next homework. I'll give you a step towards that exercise in this homework. Um, problem three is very similar to what we've done before, but instead of writing everything down using scalars, we can use vector notation. So if I write down a linear model, yi is equal to the sum of the x betas plus some air, I can reduce that and write this same thing in matrix notation. So I can write down the airs as a vector of airs, and I can write down the distribution like this. So that's what a joint normal looks like. So you might want to familiarize yourself with this distribution. I want you to place the flat prior on the betas. So I want you to keep in mind, in terms of a normal, Betas are acting like a shift. Of course, they're getting scaled through x's, but we consider the x's to be fixed constants, and so we're not thinking of it as some sort of a scale on anything because the x's aren't random. So the standard um, linear regression model. So flat prior on those, you could use the conjugate prior beta, and the math would work out fairly clean, but I just tell you what the, the typical thing is. And then you'll um, compare the answers to what you would do as a non-basic. So usually the regression line that people pick that's optimal comes in the form of the betas being x transpose x inverse x transpose y. Uh, 
You can find the variance of this classically, find the variance of that estimator in sigma squared times x transpose x inverse. I kind of expect if you've ever touched regression before, that's not completely unfamiliar to you. So they teach this to freshmen. They might not write it out for this way. So they teach this in high school. Saying that, um, we write it out a little bit different in grad school. We use matrices. Still all linear stuff. Um, and so you will compare the, um, maybe the posterior mean and variance to these answers. I'll give you a hint, they're the same. So they're identical to each other. So the Bayesian mean and variance is the same thing that the classicist or somebody else would give you. If you were an ISE, an optimizer, you would still give somebody probably x transpose x inverse, x transpose y, unless you knew something special about the problem or the data wasn't distributed normally and you do something different. But a Bayesian is basically going to give you the same regression line. Their interpretation will be a little bit different though. Saying that, that's a nice thing because a Bayesian, you could say the betas are in here or you could build a confidence interval for those betas and think about it as, as um, the coverage sort of thing. It turns out the intervals that you would construct are exactly the same. So, and you can have both interpretations. I think that's good. Problem four, this is just a passage from Peter M. Lee's book. So you can read through the passage. I put it uh, online for you. There was a statement in his book where he basically said the prosecutor's fallacy is such that if you interchange the conditionals, and in the problem setup, E stands for evidence and I stands for innocence. So they give you some blood type. They talk about what the rate of that blood is out in the population. And they say something very interesting in the passage that they say there's no innocent explanation of the data arriving at the crime scene. So here's the crime setup. Uh, police arrive, somebody's dead in a scene. There's blood everywhere. And what they're saying with this statement, there's no innocent explanation of the blood arriving, is you didn't walk by innocently and go, look at that, there's a dead body. I'm gonna bleed all over the place real quick and then I'm gonna, innocent mistake, sorry. <laughs> I usually just bleed at crime scenes and then I roll real quick. That did not happen, that's probability zero. So they are telling you something in that English statement, they're telling you something as probability one. And you'll have to think about what that means. Really, this is a stack 101, your first base class sort of question, but you just have to parse through the English. They're saying that there is a presumption on these two things being equal if the prior was set to be approximately a half. They say in Peter's, Peter says in his passage that it's a half, it turns out it's very close to a half. It's not exactly. Uh, the problem with that is that wouldn't follow our judicial system, at least the ideals of it, that you're presumed innocent. So saying it's a 50-50 probability that you're innocent or guilty walking in wouldn't be a very nice prior to use on somebody. And so if somebody did do this analysis, they would have presumed you were guilty with 50% if they flipped that conditional. You can work through that. Um, Try to work through it before you come and ask me. It's again, it's a stat 101 thing. When I first read this passage, I was like, that's not at all obvious to me. And after a couple lines of math, I was able to drive that, yeah, it is about a half. And what does all this mean? So work through that. Um, problem five is just a couple transformation problems. So it looks long-winded, but it's really very simple. So this isn't a Bayesian calculation that I'm asking you to do but I'm asking you to think about things as a Bayesian. So it really is just a transformation question. So I'm saying that if you um, put a flat prior on keys, what would the implied prior be on this quantity? This is the log of odds. And sometimes people like to think about the log of odds instead of P. They're one to one related to each other, so it just kind of depends. But if you're doing a Bayesian analysis, and for any form of statistics you are doing, it should change something that you do when you think of other transformed spaces. So if you're the type that likes to use the Box-Cox transformation and just do it willy-nilly, you're usually explaining something in terms of the transformed space, not the original space. And so what does that mean in terms of the original space? You don't really know. So is the problem. 
You're not quite sure you've explained things in a transformed way. So maybe not on the same scale you like to think about everything. Um, so if you put a flat prior on P, what would that imply about the prior on the log odds? You'll come up with something that's fairly sensible. You end up getting what's called um, Haldane's prior. So it's the beta zero, zero. And if you go the other way, um, you'll get a different prior than the typical prior that you use. So if you put a flat prior on the log odds, what does that mean about your prior on P? So I want you to be thinking about this a little bit. The five minute problem, if you're used to taking transformations. This one will take you a little bit of time. This is a simulation assignment. So I'm just gonna explain it to you what I want you to do. Um, this is that, I hate to pick on like lower classes because of course we do something a little bit better in this class. You know, you gotta start people somewhere. I hate this thing though. I really cannot stand this normal approximation. And why do we teach it to people? Because it's easy. Should people be doing this in their analysis? I would say no. So probably not. So this is that normal approximation thing. So if you end up looking at a um, binomial outcome, you can estimate P using X bar, that's P hat, and you can estimate the variance like this. So that is the variance. That is the mean. And the 1.96 thing is assuming a normal distribution. So this is supposed to be the 95% asymptotic coverage interval. And it is. That's exactly what it is. And if N was huge, I don't have any great problem with you using it. The question, what, is, what do you do when you have moderate N? What is moderate N or even small N? And I'll tell you this, 30 is not good enough. It's not even close. So what I want you to do is I want you to form this confidence interval. So what you're going to do for this problem is you're going to pick an N. I'm going to say N is something like, let's see, values that I gave you. So I think I say n is equal to 30, 50, 100, and 1,000. So you're going to be changing n, and you're going to be changing p in what I'm about to show you. But you might take n is equal to 30. You might take p is equal to 0.5, something like that. Things work pretty well in this case, and it's not because n is 30. It's because p is 0.5, and it's far away from a boundary. So what you'll do is you'll simulate data from this. So I'll get x, it's going to be coming from a binomial, n, 30, p, 0.5. And then you're going to take that x right here. This is from a binomial, so that already is, that's the total counts. So number of successes out of uh, n is equal to 30 trials. So that'll be a number between 0 and 30. You'll take that number, p hat, x, you'll divide it by n. It's going to live between 0 and 1. That's p hat. And then you'll compute this thing. Hopefully you know where it comes from. And you're going to form an interval. So I'm going to call this my lower bound and my upper bound. So the lower bound is going to be p hat minus 1.96 times the standard error. The standard error is the square root thing. And this one is going to be p hat plus 1.96 times the standard error. So I'm going to see if this covers the truth. What's the truth? 0.5. So if that's 0.49 to 0.51, it's pretty tight right around the truth. That's awesome. So that's what people would like to see. Um, if it's 0.52 to 0.54, it did not cover the truth. So the idea is if everything they taught you in STAT 101 is true and this is usable for that level of N, then we should cover the truth about 95% of the time. That relates to the 1.96. So what you're going to do is you're going to repeat this. 
repeat a whole bunch of times. And you're going to count how many times this covers the truth. So how many times do I say to repeat it? I think I say a thousand times. I say it? Yeah. yeah, a thousand times. So you're going to repeat that a thousand times, and you're going to look at your coverage rate. So hopefully, it's around 95%. So for 10,000, that would be 9,500. So if this was count, I don't care what scale you put that on. If you want to put it on 95% and divide by 1,000, do that. So it'll just change your axis. But P is going to be... Here, this is going to be 0.5. And after you repeat this a thousand times and you count how many times it covered, you're going to plot that point. And hopefully it's around 0.95. Now what you're going to do is you're going to change all your P's. And you're going to split up this into 100 points. And you're going to repeat that. And you're going to see what this line looks like. And for n is equal to 30, it looks pretty good around here and it ends up looking really bad over here. So it falls apart near the boundaries. So there's a couple of questions that I've attached to this. So I asked you to repeat this simulation with larger and larger ends. So if n gets bigger, this is gonna get tighter around here, and these will start drifting up. So the question is, is if we are within 1% of that, how big would n have to be to be within 1% of that line, our nominal rate, or our nominal count. And it's a big number. It's a lot bigger than you might think it is. So oh. normal approximation works well around here, not so well over here. And so we want methods that maybe work the same for the parameter depending on where it is. Because the thing is, is, we don't know what the parameter is. So saying that, we might know if it's moderate, big, or small. Probably do know things like that. Um, so generate a uniform spacing of the P's and repeat this and show what happens as N gets bigger and as you march across P. <coughs> so I also want you to do the exact same thing with credibles, intervals. So I'm going to ask you to construct the Bayesian posterior. That's what you've done over here. So you're going to be using this Bayesian posterior distribution that you compute in this problem that we've seen evolving in my simulations you're going to chop off 95% of the mass. Now, the mass in a posterior distribution, there's an infinite number of ways that you could collect 95% in a continuum. And so I describe to you the equal tail probabilities, and I show you a Monte Carlo procedure for estimating the 95% endpoints. And so um, you can do that if you'd like. If you can think of something that's computationally more efficient to do than what I describe in the exercise, simulating 95%, if you can think of something more efficient to do than this, you're allowed to do it. And I'll give you a quick warning that if you do this exactly as I describe it, and it's supposed to teach you a lesson, um, it'll take you more than a day to compute the whole problem. So if you're like, I got all my code written last night and it's still running, I'll ask you to turn it in next week when it finishes. So you probably want to start on that sooner. So again, um, what you're going to be doing is your, what I've asked you to do in this Monte Carlo procedure. So Monte Carlo is a randomized experiment that converges the number of times you run it increases and the answers that you get are random for any finite amount of time. That's what defines Monte Carlo is Monte Carlo. Um, I ask you to sample from the posterior distribution 10,000 times, sort all your samples, and then take your 95% quantiles. So, and that's what that's doing. And so you'll be estimating those 95% or the 0.25 quantile and the 97.5 quantile giving you a 95% range in the middle because we've just chopped off the 2.5%. That's how you might estimate that. There are certainly better ways um, to come up with that interval. Can anybody think of one? 
So at the end of it, after each iteration for any n and p, I can compute a beta distribution. I'll say it looks like this. So this is p. What you can do is you can just, with whatever the parameters are that define this beta distribution, so this is zero over here and one's over here somewhere, I can just sample a heck of a lot of times from it and construct a histogram representation. Then I can order everything, all the samples, and then I can look at what my 2.5% quantile is just by looking 0.025 times 10,000 in, do the same thing for the 97.5, and pluck those things off. And then repeat it over and over and over again for all of your setups. I'll let you think about it. It's really just the quantile function is all you need. But if you'd like to, if you didn't know where that button was, you can estimate all of this stuff. So that's it. So spend a little bit of time on this. I don't want to see 4,000 different plots on everything, so try to consolidate everything into a few nice plots that illustrates your conclusions from your simulation study. What you're going to find is that the Bayesian intervals, while they using the beta half-half prior, they end up covering like this. It's actually a little bit tighter in the middle than it is over on the endpoints, but it's still flat. And so you might ask yourself a couple questions. Why is it jigging and jagging up and down? For whatever n is, it will always do that. So it'll go up and down a little bit, even in the middle. You might think that's Monte Carlo variation. Crank up the number of times you do this, not just 1,000. Crank it up to 10,000, you'll notice that that up and down behavior does not go away. So think about that. You'll also notice that the Bayesian thing covers better and think about that prior, what it's doing, that U-shaped prior, the beta half-half, that it's penalizing things over on the endpoint differently than it's penalizing things in the middle. So um, Jerry Brown from University of Pennsylvania proved back in the 70s that the beta half-half was optimal coverage. So whether you're not a Eurobasian or you like the whole thing, if you wanted to be a really good frequentist and you weren't so um, anti-computing a posterior distribution, you could get your optimal frequentist coverage thing by doing a Bayesian analysis. It's a big surprise. Um, there's no obligation for the Bayesian to give you anything that's frequentist covering, and that's not what all our priors do. Um, but I will tell you the beta half-half does do that. Um, also, it is the Jeffries prior, so it's transform invariant, and it's also the reference prior that it pulled, the posterior will pull away from the prior as fast as possible in the cool black fiber sense. So even though we just wrote the thing down and we're using it, there are lots of good reasons why you might like that prior. Any questions? Okay. So get started on that, and then I'll see those of you that are so inclined at review session this week, um, and we'll do another one next week. Let's get back to our example. So we have one data point, came from this normal distribution, and we want to compute the marginal distribution of mu given x1. So this is the same thing, this is proportional to taking the joint distribution. one in integrating out phi. So they're equivalent to each other. This is just off by a normalizing constant. So I didn't go through the trouble of normalizing all of this right here. This is the likelihood times the prior, so it's proportional to the posterior distribution. 
So what I've been teaching you to, to do is recognize the kernels of distributions, know the properties of them, and then your integrals are a lot easier to solve. And so let's just do that. So we wrote down last time, This was the integral of 1 over 2 pi square root. If you would like, a v can go here. We don't need it for anything, or actually we do. We need to be very careful and put that phi in there. This usually is a sigma squared down here, but we're changing everything to the precision analysis. e to the minus v over 2, x1 minus mu, squared, and that's everything. So and now I need to discuss my priors, times pi mu. I'm going to integrate over that, and this will go from 0 to infinity. So the likelihood is the easy part. So you just write it down. If you know it's generated the data, you have some sort of a model, use it. Plug it in. So the only question is, is which priors? Now, for the um, conditional analyses on mu and phi, we've discussed conjugate priors. Those are an option. Um, I could take this thing and I could factorize it and write it down like this. And use this as the conjugate prior on mu and use that as the conjugate prior on phi. The question is, is why am I factorizing them? And what I'm saying a priori before I've seen the data is I don't know what their joint relationship is. Their joint relationship comes through the data. I will point out that they are related to each other because you can't factorize this quantity right here. You'll always have the mu's next to the phi's, and if you can't factorize them, they're not independent of each other. So a priori, I don't have any good reason to build an association between those two things. Now there is something called the joint reference prior. There's something that would be, if you were trying to aim at something that maybe was had good frequentist properties, you might be thinking about how to come up with something that covers well in a set. So I want my whole set to cover and not just the margins. Um, that's very typical to do in maybe lower dimensional settings. So, but in high dimensional settings, giving somebody like a big region, let's just think in low D10, we can't even think about it, what it all means. If you're a robot, you might be able to work with that quantity and use it for prediction and make things a little bit better, but you're not going to be able to interpret it very well. And so it's very common for people to just use properties from the marginal analyses or the conditional analyses and just say, I'm just going to use priors that work well in conditional senses or in marginal senses. And I'm not going to build that relationship in. Um, the, there is something called the joint Jeffries prior. We'll see that in a couple of weeks and it would lead to a different prior here. Saying that, what I'm about to show you is what most people do. So they'll just say, I like uh, products of my priors because I'm not injecting a relationship between the parameters. The data needs to do that for me. I think that that's okay. And so it's really just a, a thing. If you're a priori saying maybe, maybe you think if you're doing the conjugate analysis, maybe you think, I know a lot about mu. It's centered around five and you can calibrate your beliefs by controlling that hyperparameter for that prior. Um, does that tell you anything about the precision or the variance? And I don't think it does. So if I told you the mean of the process is five, did I help you to think about the variance of the process? If I said this process is highly variable, the variance is 12, did I tell you where it's centered? I didn't. So that's all this is really presupposing, is that you're not going to inject um, joint knowledge. Again, it is possible to do that. And there are cases where you might want to consider it, but I don't think this is a very good example for one of those cases. So what we did last time is we just took this prior, proportional to 1 on mu, and 1 over phi um, was the prior on the precision. And we like this. This was a limit of the conjugate prior. Both of them are limits of the conjugate priors. They're both improper, so they both don't integrate, um, but they don't stick a lot of mass anywhere, which is kind of the upside of using an improper prior. You probably want your prior beliefs to be diffused. 
Uh, we're not going to do inference on the prior, so I don't really care that they're not probability distributions, so no big deal. If I wanted to think of them as probability distributions, I could think about it through the limiting sense. If I insisted on making them pr proper, I might take the conjugate analysis and use an awfully large um, variance for its uh, hyperparameter. And I might use something like 12 trillion to the billion to the quadrillion to the zillion. And eventually your computer is going to say, I think you mean infinite. And it's just going to round for you. So that would be equivalent to doing this if you didn't introduce a whole bunch of floating point errors in your code, which you probably would do. So you'd probably get man if you did it. Um, computers are a little bit imperfect. And this spreads mass around phi. It's obviously stacking it a little bit closer to the boundary, but this had an important property. It was scale invariant. And so I wasn't injecting information about the scale, per se. And this wasn't injecting information about the location. So at least we had some good reasons to use this prior. Let's just walk through the steps of computing the posterior distribution. And so if I did this, I could get rid of this thing, that's not helping me. It's not a function of phi. I don't have this normalized in the first place. So just writing that down is pretty arbitrary. So I'm going to take this thing to be 1 over phi times 1, if you will. So that's just phi inverse. And I'm going to denote that right here. So there would be my phi inverse term. E to the minus phi. I'll write this just a little bit different, x1 minus mu squared over 2. d phi, we're integrating between 0 and infinity. And how we did this is we recognized this was the kernel of a gamma distribution. So it looks like a gamma. So just as an aside, gammas look like this. Z to the alpha minus 1, E to the minus Z beta. So that's the kernel of a gamma. So gamma alpha beta. And usually there's a normalizing constant out in front of it, and we don't have it. So I'll just remind you what it is. It looks like this beta to the alpha over gamma alpha. If you saw me about to flip it upside down, it's because what the beta would do in the other parameterization, so I even have to stop myself and make sure I'm doing it right. This is the parameterizational stick with throughout class. But again, be very careful if you invoke a gamma in something like R, it's going to have that beta flipped upside down. By default, and depending on whether or not you specify the rate or the scale parameterization, it'll flip it around for you. Or you can control it and flip it upside down or not. I usually like to plug in that I'm going to work with a rate parameterization or something like that. Okay, so it looks like a gamma. Which gamma does it look like? Here's how I get beta tilde. So that's beta tilde. And that is alpha tilde. So we recognize them through this parameterization. I'm using the dummy argument Z to tell you that this is just information about a distribution. So Z is my random variable. Um, so I know if I integrated this for any alpha and beta that were non-zeros, this thing would integrate and it would integrate to one because it's a probability distribution. It's a density. So this is missing that. So this is going to integrate to the inverse of the normalized. When you first, first took your first probability class, they had you work out problem, the normalizing constants for a long time and say, find the normalizing constant. We're doing it backwards. So this thing right here is going to integrate to gamma alpha tilt over beta tilt alpha tilt. This is about where we were last time. So we just plug this thing in. This is a gamma 1 half. That's just a constant. So again, our posterior is only proportional to this. And then I'm going to take x1 minus mu squared divided by 2. And I'm going to raise it to the minus 
one half. So it's not minus one half, this is a plus. My minus is a little bit premature because usually I flip this thing up over in a second. So let's do that. So this thing is going to be proportional to, just write down what we solve, is proportional to, and I can get rid of this. this Proportionality constant, that's a constant. So since I've chucked them once, I might as well just keep throwing them away. And this will be x1 minus mu. Absolute value is how that changes. And this looks like this. Centered in the right place. That looks something like that. So the difficulty with this is it's improper. And so if you're a Bayesian, you're out of luck. So Bayesians are always striving for one thing. They want a probabilistic interpretation of the things they don't know. And so you're not going to get that probabilistic interpretation. There were a couple solutions from last time. So Sam, and I respect this because Sam's an engineer, and he's going to, oh, well, okay, looks good. You know? So he's going to just chop off the tails, bang, bang and say, stop adding that stuff because I don't care about what's in there. In high dimensions, I'm less sympathetic to doing things like that because all that mass in the tails really impacts an analysis. And so if you just even think about it in a normal distribution, when you have a high leverage point, an outlier, um, it steers the whole analysis. Why does that happen? It's because of the Gaussian tails. If you think of it as maximum likelihood analysis or you're doing the sort of thing that we doing in homework one, where you're saying the data is generated as a normal. So the tails steer all that stuff. So the tails to me are a really big deal. Um, I do kind of like that this is centered at least somewhere sensible. And somebody else said, instead of doing that, use the conjugate analysis. And you'll get something that's proper. And both of those are, are possibilities. Of course, there's the questions, where to chop? What did I just say about all that mass over in the other side? What you would effectively be doing is using the same prior that we came up with, but truncating mu at whatever these points are. So I'd say that's part of your prior assumption. And so you'd be bearing that into your prior assumption, or if you use the conjugate prior, you'd have to say something similar to it is to how far you're diffusing things. And that would really control where those boundaries are too. And so my claim is, is that your analysis would be basically your prior with a sensible center and location. But all the probability distribution stuff would be controlled from your prior and not really the data. So there was another solution that somebody came up with, Anna threw this out, go get more data. And I wanna just point out, Again, we need to say something jointly about mu and phi, and we've only got one data point. So I would say you should not be doing this analysis. You're trying to say something about the center, where it's centered. You're also trying to say something about the variability of the distribution, which is controlled through the precision parameter. Um, you can't say that much. So I personally think this is a really good analysis that tells you not only should you not be using those priors that we liked for good reason, you probably shouldn't even be doing the analysis. So um, I'll just say this. Let me draw a quick picture. Let's say I had a data point right here. Let's say that was x1. If all of a sudden I went and I said, I need another data point before I'm willing to do this analysis. If somebody came in and said, how x2 is right there, and I'm trying to denote that this is close together. So I go, wow, it's really weird. Huh, you don't have a lot of variability in your data. But if they came back with a third data point and it was over here, I'd say stop the presses. Like if they did get that third data point and it was right in here, I would find that to be extremely compelling information. So, but if that third data point was very far away, I'd think you need more sampling. It really depends on which phenomena you're studying out there, how much data you're going to need. Uh, but I tend to think two data points is infinitely more informative than one data point. 
and I find three to be the absolute lower limit that I would ever look at to do any analysis. And I have done an analysis with three data points before. They were high dimensional data points too. So a lot of my analysis was driven by the prior dynamics. So we're studying the dynamics of the system and barely calibrating it. So I thought it was a case where the data points showed up reasonably close to each other. It was a genomic thing, so you can't run evolution again. So if I had a time machine, I would have gotten more data. So probably not one data point. So I don't like the idea of changing the prior for this. I really would just stop the analysis. You got this one data point, you want me to answer way too many questions with it, go find somebody else. So I could even introduce you to them. So somebody will do this analysis for you. I don't want my name on it. So what you do is go get more data. So XI comes from that distribution. And I'll write the IID in here. If I don't write IID, I probably mean IID. So and I'm going to do this some number of times. And all we have to do is just modify our analysis with all of that. So we're going to do the exact same thing. So I'm going to say this is cat x, which is just all of my data. This is going to be proportional to. I'll do the same thing and throw away all my normalizing constants. I'm going to integrate phi between 0 and infinity. And the likelihood now looks like this. I goes from 1 to n, phi to the 1 half, e to the minus 1 half, xi minus mu squared. And I'll throw my phi up here. I've got my priors that I need to integrate against. So I'll use the same prior, and I'll just replace everything. I'll just simplify everything. This is just integral phi to the n over 2. There's n of those. There's my prior. e to the minus, and I'll write it like this. Sum i goes from 1 to n, xi's minus mu over 2. I know what I'm looking for. I know I'm looking for the gamma, and that's why I kind of just shuffle this around depending on what I'm doing with it. So dp. I just have to recognize which gamma this is and write down its normalizing constant. So how do I pluck off its parameters? Same place that I would have looked before. And we'll almost have a solution. So this thing is going to look like gamma alpha tilde divided by beta tilde to the alpha tilde. So I'll just rewrite that thing down again. This analysis is all proportional to this, so we need to recognize the distribution and name its parameters. So this will look like this, gamma n over 2. Lo and behold, that's still just a number, and was fixed. So that's all part of the normalizing constant, but I'll leave it there for a second. And this will look like sum of the xi's minus mu squared divided by 2. i goes from 1 to n, and this will be raised to the n over 2. And so now the name of the game is the same thing that we've done for all of our analyses is recognize that. So no surprise, it's going to look like one of these. This is a t distribution. It doesn't look like that form. And just like eyeballing this, I can't tell you where it's centered. I'm not sure. I can't tell you where the scale parameter is or the degrees of freedom. So there's three parameters that underlie a t distribution. So we don't say that it's the mean and the variance, because sometimes t's don't have means and variances. But they still have these parameters where everything is centered. So that's still a location parameter. That's still a scale parameter right there. So it does have that interpretation. I'll say more about this next time. So we're going to pick up, talk about the t distribution briefly, 
and then we'll do some algebra to put this into the form. Quick question, where do you think this thing is centered? X bar. Where do you think the, what do you think the sigma squared is? What would they estimate with that? What would you use? It's just a guess. So X bar is correct. It turns out we'll show that this centers at X bar. That's always true. Anytime you see these quadratic things, everything's actually centered around the mean. We'll show that next time. Turns out it has something to do with S squared. So it's going to be S squared over N, your typical variance estimator. Again, this doesn't have to be a variance. So, and the degrees of freedom, and minus one. So it's going to be all the stuff that you're used to seeing. Let's come back and talk about that next time, work through everything. And then I'm going to take you through uh, a basic predictive analysis. So we're going to have all the tools that a Bayesian has, and then we're going to do a few other distributions so that you can get a repeat of what we've done with the so far on another set of distributions, learn about a little bit more, and then eventually we'll get into all the computational stuff, the high dimensional stuff. That's it for now, and hopefully I see some of you guys tomorrow. Thanks, guys.